Hello, and welcome to Season 3 of Beyond Teaching, a series featured on the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from Pacific University, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. To be a successful psychology academic or professional, it takes more than teaching research or clinical skills. That is, today's professionals were probably not taught everything they need to know in graduate school. The Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, strives to fill that gap. We chat about the topics we need to know about to be successful in our careers, but we didn't know to ask about in graduate school. When we don't have the expertise among us, we go out and find someone. And this is particularly relevant in Season 3. These 10 episodes were recorded from June 7th through November 2nd, 2021, and they are being released starting December 29th, 2021, and Season 3 will finish on March 30th, 2022. What are you in for? Oh, the places we'll go. We'll chat about leveraging social media, publications, and playing that classic academic game, how to make decisions about co-authoring, dealing with student requests for accommodations and exceptions, which seems especially relevant in this era, and maximizing student office hours, or what are called student hours these days. Also in Season 3, we invited a number of guests to come on the podcast and share their expertise with us. This included Sun Yung Lee in Saikai's Faculty Support Advisory Committee and what Saikai can do for faculty, Loretta McGregor and the difference between mentoring and advising, with extra information about imposter phenomenon tossed in for good measure. Sandy Jenkins and James Lane share their experience from two accumulated careers about clinical supervision. And Beatrice Krauss shares her delightful adventures in retirement, which depart greatly from our retirement stereotypes or typical tropes. We truly hope that you'll enjoy season three of Beyond Teaching. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Beyond Teaching. This is Asani, and I am flying solo today, Azure. It's me, but don't worry, no monologue on my part. I'm joined by two of my esteemed colleagues who are here today to talk a little bit about clinical supervision. So for those of you that are clinical or counseling psychologists, you well know that supervision can be a large part of some of the work that we do. For those of you that are not clinical or counseling oriented, Clinical supervision is some of what we do in, the, in, in our work in terms of guiding and mentoring students in their clinical roles. So we're going to have this conversation with the idea that the three of us gathered here, I'll introduce our guests in just a moment here. It didn't take any coursework on how to do clinical supervision. We just sort of launched into it. So what are the best practices? What are the tips and strategies? What are the do's and don'ts? The recommendation. And so with that background, let me introduce my two colleagues and also invite them to share anything else they want to share about their bio, their background. I'm joined today by Dr. Sandy Jenkins, one of my esteemed colleagues. She is a faculty emerit. Is it emeriti? Emeritus? Emeriti. Emeritus. Emeritus. Thank you. Emerita, faculty emerita from Pacific University in, in Oregon, where she taught and was involved in clinical supervision, diversity work for many years. And so she's joining us today. Hey there, Sandy. Hello. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> and I'm also joined by my esteemed colleague, Dr. James Lane, faculty emeritus. All right, I got it right. Faculty emeritus, also from Pacific University in Oregon, where he was also involved in clinical supervision, teaching, and many other I think you were a dean. Weren't you an interim dean for a little while too, James? You wore many hats in the time that you were in our department. So we're also just so delighted to have you here. Hey, James. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. Is there anything else that you want to share with our listeners about your bios that I did not include? I didn't formally collect anything. I'm just basing it upon our, our friendship and time together. <laughs> Sandy and I overlap considerably. 
<laughs> in our time together. I think. Probably yeah. the longest term colleague that I've, I've ever had. And how long have the two of you known each other? Well, well, 90 or 1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1999-1
I thought every time I taught a class, every time I prepared to teach a class, every time I prepared for supervision and did the supervision, there were things I was learning and growing. And so that was part of the real pleasure for me. Absolutely. Just to echo part of that is one of the things that is clearest to me from my whole career is the best way to learn anything is to try to teach it. And I think as a human being, I grew and matured so much through supervision. Yeah, it's, I feel it certainly makes you a, a better teacher, a better academic, better professional, but also a better person. I, I feel like also working with the students in many ways. It d- definitely touches on that personal level as well. For our listeners, when we talk about supervision here, we're talking about working with teams of students that are between, what, three to maybe five students or so, something like that. I usually had four or five. Four or five students, yeah. And the students tend to be in their second year, right, in graduate school. Mm -hmm. Has been, okay, most of them. And maybe you might also have an intern, which for clinical oriented graduate students, those are the folks who are in their final year of their clinical work and it's a full-time position. So that's kind of the composition of, of the teams, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so great. Okay. So maybe we could talk a little bit about some best practices and tips and tricks and things of, 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 of that sort. As you look back over your years of clinical supervision, are there any particular lessons learned that you could distill for our listeners moving forward and thinking about that these might be folks who are maybe new in a position who, like us, is, is, is a part of the role to do clinical supervision or are looking at starting maybe in the fall, let's say, and thinking, my gosh, how am I going to do this? And perhaps folks who are a bit more seasoned might also be listening to and thinking, how can I refresh and revise what I've been doing in clinical supervision? So as you think back on your years of supervising, do you have any words of wisdom, lessons learned? I could probably talk for a couple of weeks. Do it, Sandy. Go ahead. <laughs> well, well, get us one at least. <laughs> how did I learn Well, I learned because in my training, we had a lot of practica and I therefore had a lot of supervisors. And on my internship, there were rotations. uh, There were several rotations. So with that, I had several supervisors. And I learned that there were things a supervisor could do that were really just right on and really helpful and really aided my growth. And then there were the ones who were just lousy. I mean, there were just these people. <laughs> it was a wipeout. And so I learned from doing it as a student and as an intern, what kinds of things were helpful for me and what kinds of things just were not. And so that was pretty good grounding in what kinds of things to do and what kinds of things not to do. Yeah. That's really helpful to to look back and to think about interactions that we have had with supervisors, mentors, teachers, whatever. Think about what worked, what didn't. Try to emulate the things that did work and then let go of the things that didn't, for sure. Do you have one thing that you would say, Sandy, that you emulated or that you decided that this is the thing that I want to try to bring out in my clinical supervision? I don't have one thing. Uh, There's many things. I'll come back to it later when we talk about what we actually did as supervisors, because I brought a lot of that to that particular, how do I want to do this? So let me come back to that later. Okay. That sounds great. James, how about for you? Lessons learned or things like that? I'll have to say that my experience with supervision as a student was very different from hers and that I look back and there's only one supervisor for my internship that I felt I had. Well, all of them were positive relationships, but this is one in which I felt like I was really learning something. I, I look back and I think, I, I don't really know what went on with <laughs> my supervisors. <laughs> they were just, they didn't seem to be terribly invested in, in the work, kind of assumed that I would know what to do. <laughs> And just was kind of checking to make sure I wasn't hurting anybody. So I I don't think that I learned a tremendous amount 
from previous supervisors. What I think, how I think that impacted me is that it's led me to try to balance my need as a supervisor to make sure that clients are well cared for with treating the supervisees in the way I wanted to be treated. Mm-hmm. Uh, show them respect, to have concern for them, to really be interested in them. Uh, so I think it, it's probably impact the way I think about and relate to students more than any particular technique or strategy uh, to treat to treat the students the way I want I would want to be treated. Yeah, focus on the relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so you move from a place of having supervisors in your training that weren't terribly memorable to being, James, a supervisor that the students really remember a lot. So you've done a good job with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. I am so curious to know what it's like to be your supervisee. And so, Sandy, you were saying that you had some things you wanted to share in terms of what you actually do. And so I'm so curious to hear about what it's like to sit in, sit in a supervision, group supervision with you and to get supervision, what that experience is like and what you do specifically. Well, what you've done, I guess I could say. Yeah. And it changed over time what mm-hmm. I did and how I did it. Uh, a lot did depend on what was happening with students. Well, I start with my job is to teach people how to do what I do as a clinician. And I do a specific kind of clinical work. And so how do I teach them how to do that? And the model that I use is long-term psychodynamic uh, psychotherapy. And that's what I'm teaching them. I'm teaching them how to think in those ways and how to work in those ways. What is that process? And there's some things in particular that I thought were important. Learning how to be genuine. Okay. Learning how to understand what a co-created relationship process looks like. Because in my way of working, there's two main relationship pieces. There's the transference and counter-transference, and you're constantly analyzing both. And so you can't do a lot of performing, which new students begin to do almost immediately. (laughs) There's a performance they're trying to put together and they want to know what is the script? You know, tell me what I'm supposed to say. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. And you have to start out by saying, no, this isn't Shakespeare. This is not, (laughs) there's no manual. (laughs) There's no script, okay? You have to learn to relate to people in some genuine here now way. Yeah, because in those first experiences of students, I think are without exception, pretty anxious, aren't they? They come being very highly anxious into group supervision, into clinic. And so you're dealing with that, I think, right from the start, right? And so I think such good advice that you're offering, Sandy, in terms of telling students that there is no script here. Be your not authentic. Not in the way I work. Not in right. the way I work. There is none. And so helping people learn to be comfortable with that. But I've got a phone thing happening. Well, that's okay. We'll edit it out. No problem. James, how about you? What's it like to be in supervision with, with you? And how do you begin with your students? How do you continue with them? Well, over the course of the year, things change a bit. Initially, I do some teaching, teaching around developing the kind of problem list that administration demands at this point and how to translate that into goals in therapy. And while I I do that within a, a cognitive behavioral kind of framework, I still see the developing relationship as being the much more important piece of what's going on. And to talk in a little swingy way, it's like psychotherapy is about hanging out together and there's a, a CBT framework for doing that. There are other frameworks for doing it, but if you can't hang out together, you're not going to be doing the client any good. And that hanging out involves you know, communicating the, the basic Rougerian kinds of conditions of uh, unconditional positive regard, genuineness, et cetera. And so I'll 
teach a little bit to provide more of the framework, but they can learn a lot of that from the book, from the classes and so forth. And I see my job as more helping them translate that into a way of being with, with their clients. Yeah. And I use humor a lot. And just as an aside, one year, my students collected my sayings and some of them without the context of the relationship could have been heard as, as insulting or demeaning of the students, but it was within the context of a relationship where I felt like I could tease them. And, uh, I think that the teasing communicates in, in that context, the teasing communicates respect, care, a connection, which I think is as important as any of the content, uh, that I would teach. Absolutely. And I imagine through that care and respect and seeing them each as individuals is how you, both of you foster some cohesion among your supervision groups. Cause we're also kind of wanting that too, in some ways also, right. Is that the, the supervision group is not just a set of individuals, but really does have some group dynamics that are happening that are positive, that helps to foster learning, kind of co-learning. Is there anything else that you do specifically to help to foster group cohesion? Or do you feel like some of the practices that you've just described are generally enough to ensure that the students are getting along with each other and helping each other with cases and things like that? I no, I didn't foster cohesion. I think that's either going to happen or it isn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, you can't, this stuff isn't scripted. I didn't foster people getting along with each other or liking each other or feeling good about anything, including me. I want people to be in their real experience. Let me give you an example of what I mean. And this is, was a turning point for me in my supervision work. There was a student who had an older woman. She had an older woman client. And the old, she was telling me the older woman was complaining that she was too young, that she didn't really know enough to be able to help her. And I said, well, just be empathic. You don't have to know things. Just do a good job of listening to her and letting her talk and letting her explore her feelings and feel, get comfortable doing that. Because yeah, the, if there's a 10, 20 year age difference, you may not have a lot to offer her. But I kept hearing more and more about complaints. And so sometimes what I would do is just go to one of the meetings and speak to the client. And she said, yeah, she's too young for me. She just does not understand. And I said, okay. Here, I get you. And with the student, I said, all right, I get what she's saying. I think she's right. Just be yourself with her. And she looked at me and with all seriousness, she said, but what if you don't know what that is? Oh, wow. And I thought, okay, this means I need to do something to regroup with how I'm supervising. And so I decided we would divide the three-hour, four-hour meeting in, in half, the first half would be us just talking to each other about ourselves or each other or our clients. And then the last half would be focused on clinical work. And that dynamic really changed a lot of things for the better for some people. Other people found it really hard, really challenging, really difficult. But it helped people get a sense of what does it mean to be in a relationship with someone and let them be themselves and I'm myself. And that was real challenging for some people. Other people loved it. So it varied. I mean, I think some people thought their experience with me was terrific. Others were, oh my God, what did I get myself into? <laughs> But then down the line, they come to appreciate it, I'm sure, Sandy. People absolutely did appreciate it later in retrospect, yes. Yeah, I think yeah. the flexibility that you're both kind of describing in supervision is really kind of important too, right? So maybe you have a, 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 an agenda or set of ideas of things that you want to do, but to be real nimble and to meet the supervisee where they're at, I think is really important, right? That's the thing, James, that I think you wish that you would have had when you were in your own training that I imagine that you also bring to the work too, is just responding to the supervisee in the moment to support them in doing their best work and discovering who they are in, in the clinical context and in life too. So 
for sure. Well, where should we go next? What else do you think people would want to know about clinical supervision? One of my things that became important for me was because it's long-term psychodynamic therapy and I have one year, obviously I cannot train them how to do that successfully in one year. Um, so I started to focus on what can I teach them that what they can make use of down the road? In other words, I stopped thinking of I'm supervising and teaching how to fix or cure the client you have now and prepare you for the clients that are to come. And I started thinking of it that way. And that was real helpful because the, it took the pressure off of them for one thing. I mean, you don't have to be successful with this particular client. You never have to be successful with any client. You just have to do your best with all of your clients, okay? But it helped them start to think a little differently. It gave them a little room. You may not be successful with any client you have now, but you will be much more successful five years from now was one of the ways I approach things. I feel that's probably so helpful, was so helpful for you too, as a supervisor to yeah. think in that yeah. way as well, that because a year isn't very long in many no. ways when you think about train these students to do this important work. Yeah. So it's a good way. Yeah. To think for yourself too, like I, as a supervisor, I can't do it all right now. This is just a piece of the larger puzzle for them in terms of getting trained as clinicians. So for sure. And how about for you, James? How, what kinds of things were you hoping that, or actually you're still, you currently supervise still. I keep talking in the past tense because Sandy's as far as I know, right, Sandy, you no longer supervise, or supervise but James, you continue to do so. And so what kinds of things are you hoping that students will know or come out on the other side after a year of being supervised by you? I'm hoping that they will think more clearly about what they're doing, that they're able to answer for themselves the question, what do you want to happen? <laughs> with the clinic? And when students say, what do I do? <laughs> That's the, the question that comes up for me is what do you want to happen? What, what do you want to happen in this case? And so I, I like them to kind of gradually shape in that direction where that they can ask that question for themselves. I mean, my lights just went out, but that doesn't matter, I guess. And what do I want to happen? And then think through, be able to think through clearly what, what do I need to do to help bring that about rather than any particular skill or anything else. It's more the, the thinking clearly um, about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know that understanding your own frame of mind, your own frame of reference mm -hmm. and be guided by that. For my students, because I'm a health psychologist, I think I'm really training them to be successful and have some confidence in working in the medical context in these settings in which they might be the only psychologist on their team and they're working alongside surgeons and nurses and things like that. And they really have to sort of be able to hold their own. And so I'm hoping to build a little bit of confidence to work in those contexts. And to also, I really emphasize a lot the case presentation, being able to summarize and talk about your clinical case in a brief format to other professionals who might not be psychologists. Like, what does that look like? What does, you know, how would you do that? So, so yeah, we all have our different sort of outcomes here. What else? We start to find that we get towards a place where we're not having much to talk about. Then we're like, all right, we've said, oh, I, I can keep going. Uh, <laughs> What else would you like to know? In terms of best practices, what else would I like to know? Looks like we lost James entirely. <laughs> it really went good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, is there anything else you'd like to know or in terms of best practices? Well, what to do when we have a team that's difficult? Uh, and that does happen, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. When you have either one person on your clinical supervision team or the entire team that is presenting some difficulty of some sort, how do you as a supervisor navigate that and really, you know, kind of retain your sanity? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Absolutely, there were teams that were difficult. And sometimes it, it wasn't a good idea. I had someone on my team that really should just not have been on my team. It was inappropriate for them, what I was doing and how I was doing it. And sometimes there were adjustments made about those people moving to some other team. I'm fine with. After a while, you get a reputation, though, and people kind of know what they're getting. And they do some self-selecting. I thought there were the people I really want her, you know, based on the things they've heard. And then there were the people, oh, my God, I hope I, I'm not going to get her based on the things they heard. But, um... My approach is to have us always looking at ourselves and talking to ourselves and, and looking at what am I doing as part of something that's a relationship that I'm having, the relationship experience I'm having, and the relationship experience other people are having, and really talk about that in that way. And when that happened in the right way, it definitely helped a whole lot. I mean, people could see some of the ways in which they were bringing things that weren't strong things to a group process. Uh, also, let me go back up. One of the things I thought was important was that I have some sense of balance between praising people and criticizing people. I think it's important for people in learning to do this profession right to be able to handle both to be able to handle praise and handle criticism. I know that's been extremely important for me, the way I work and, and my own growth as a professional and as a person. Can I handle criticism just as well as praise? So having people really look at what their process was, what am I bringing to this process as my contribution to it? Right. Yeah, and I love your idea, what you've been saying about just kind of putting it out on the table and really having discussions about it and thinking through it as a, opposed to letting those dynamics remain hidden and still continue to operate kind of behind the scenes. Yeah, psychodynamic work. You can't do that, right? You cannot do that in psychodynamic work. There's nothing hidden in psychodynamic work. In fact, the hidden processes is what the whole thing is about. Right, you know? right, yes. Now, James, you and I are cognitive behaviorally oriented so tell us a little bit about how you have managed those clinical teams that have been a little bit more challenging. People aren't getting along or whatever the dynamic might be. Well, I generally have some combination of group and individual. And so sometimes it's, my judgment is that I, I need to tackle some of these things at the individual level and say, you investigate what's going on for that person as well as giving them some direction. But more broadly, and it fits for managing a difficult group, but I think just more generally, what I think is important to think about in doing supervision is that whether you intend to or not, you're always modeling something. You're always modeling something for the students. And so, really good point. Yeah, that you need to do that with awareness. I, I have, you know, I struggle with... Of, I like to avoid conflict as much as possible, and yet, how can you possibly do this work? And so I have to you know, remind myself that how I approach this difficult situation is going to be conveying something to the students. And so I try to put on my big boy pants and, <laughs> and do the difficult thing. It's challenging sometimes to, to do that. And, but I, I think, again, more generally, I think that if I were to carry away one general principle is that as the supervisor, you're always modeling something. Mm. And to do that with awareness will take you a long way, I think. I, I totally want to say yes to that. And the modeling can mean more than anything else. Mm. What, what do they see and how you behave and respond and what you do in difficult situations or how you deal with conflict? Modeling is major. Mm -hmm. And I would say that the students don't necessarily have the expectation that we're going to get it right all the time. You know, that well, we're, we're being, <laughs> right? We're not about being perfect. We do. We, we need to start over with genuine. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Right back to that. Yeah. yeah. It's not about being perfect. It's about being real, right? This, this is a thing. And sometimes even revealing to students or a group kind of what your process is 
or why you've arrived at a certain decision or why you're deciding to have the conversation in this particular way, or if you've made a misstep, talking about that too, putting on the table, I think are all really good learning opportunities for students. So for sure. Well, I want to come back to what James just said, that there's no way you can do this kind of work and avoid conflict. As much as you might hate it, there's no way you can avoid it. And so whenever a conflict happened in the group, that that was one of those learning opportunities is one way to think about it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I thought that we might begin to wrap up a little bit with just talking about the peculiar supervision year that we've had this last academic year. And so, Sandy, of course, you, I could see you smiling and chuckling because you weren't involved in any of that. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Supervision and clinical services via Zoom or, te- you know, telehealth. But James, you and I were in the trenches with, and we were just talking before we hit record that we hadn't met our clinical teams in person until the very end of the year. We decided to get together with our teams for a social, but hadn't laid eyes on them in person at, at all. And so that was very new, I think, for us. So, so James, what do you make of this last year? What went well for you and what didn't go was great. <laughs> well, I wasn't the flavor of the mud with my group for quite some time. <laughs> ah, uh-huh. it, it's, I think it was very difficult for them to experience me in relationship. And I think it was very easy for them to attribute or to view me primarily through my characteristics of being an old white male and attributing things to me based on that. And I certainly am not perfect and will occasionally say things that aren't skillful. And so it was like, we had a hard time getting over those initial impressions, I think. And it, but gradually over time, I think they came to realize that, yes, I had my, I did have their interest at heart. And that I wasn't such a bad guy. So, but it's very difficult to do that with, you're not in the same room with the person. And I I think people are more generally appreciating the limitations of teletherapy, but negotiating or anything over, over electronics like this, I think you can still do some good work, but it's just really limited. And that, that was my experience is that I had no sense, I mean, I felt off balance knowing that these people didn't know me. Yeah. The relationship building piece was much more challenging this year, trying to do it over Zoom. Absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. That, that was, that was I doubt problem. I could have done it. I could have done, no, I really, I can't see how I could have done my supervision model over Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. It was a challenge for sure. So, so hopefully this fall we'll get to be, back in person. That's the plan, right, James? Yeah. Okay. I think so. <laughs> that, that'll be great. So is there anything else that you feel like you wanted to share that we didn't talk about here as we kind of wrap up here about clinical supervision? I, I mainly did it for the pleasure of it. Mm-hmm. Um, And I put a lot of myself into it because I thought this is one of those things I really enjoy. I enjoy being with a group of people and experiencing a a group process with them, which again, Zoom, I would have felt completely lost, but that process of a group of people is one of the things that was one of my greatest pleasures. I'll need to make a decision this fall about whether I'll do it another time. <laughs> Sandy knows how it is as you get a little bit. Of it. it's, it's... Yes, I do know how it is as you get older. <laughs> yes, I do. So I need to make the decision because then we'll have to start acquiring some CE hours and so forth to get relicensed, which I'm licensed until November of. 2022, but if I sign on for another year, I'll need to re- you know, re-up my license and I'll need to make that decision. And if I decide not to, I will definitely miss it, but there are other things in life too. 
Oh, yeah. I'm sure that Sandy could point you in the direction of some other things you might be able to get into when you, you let that go. <laughs> Lots of fun things. Like I said, let's have lunch at some point. <laughs> I look forward to that. I, I owe you a couple of lunches, but let's see. <laughs> at least a couple. I love it. Look at us. Clinical supervision, making connections all the way around. So yeah. great. So great. Thank you, Asani, for everything you do in the school. Oh, thank you, Sandy. That's yeah, very you are fun. a real treasure for them. I, I hope they all understand that. I appreciate that, Sandy. Thank you for Absolutely. saying that. Thank you both for joining. If you were just joining us, this is Beyond Teaching. Your host, Asani, here talking with Dr. Sandy Jenkins and James Lane about clinical supervision. Thanks for joining us. Signing off. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.